And in just a minute, I'm going to ask Brother C.T. to come. And if you haven't been with us so far in our missions conference, let me take just a moment to introduce him, and he can do more with that if he'd like to as well. But Brother C.T. is a veteran preacher. It, uh, uh, when, uh, when you're my age, you never um, think about uh, ever getting to be Brother C.T.'s age. In other words, you look at guys like him, and you're like, man, he's been preaching you know, for what, about a hundred years or something. Like that. <laughs> so, yeah, God's given him. I think a, he's he's a gifted preacher, but uh, I think God's just given him a wonderful spirit to be able to come into church and be a servant. And he, he's just been a blessing to us all week long, and uh, we've just really appreciated. He has Lord's greatly used him. He's got a lot of wisdom. He has a lot of a lot of knowledge and knows a lot about church planting. Knows a lot about missions and and consequently has ended up in particularly in that field. But he's been a blessing to our church, and he loves the Word of God, and that really is what he is more than anything else, is just a preacher of the Word of God. And if you'll listen this morning, God's Spirit will use him in your life. He's going to come and preach the Gospel, and he's going to preach the message for us. And so I want to just ask, I know that it's later than we usually get into our preaching service, but we're going to feed you afterward. Amen. And so uh, the, just... just uh, if you will, just settle your hearts and your minds and try to get your focus on what we're here for, and that's to be fed spiritually. And if you'll allow the Lord, I believe He's going to greatly use the message this morning and the Word. And so we're thankful that He's come. Brother C.T., we come preach for us. Thank you, Pastor. It's been a great delight to be with you, you personally, your wife, and uh, all of your fine people. I know that many of you have been here right along ever since Wednesday night, and I appreciate your faithfulness to be in the services when you can. I know that others were, would like to have been here for every service and couldn't for whatever reason, but uh, thank you for being here today. And what a, great, uh, what a great thing to see all of these places that we come from. <laughs> I, I guarantee you I have preached in places where uh, you, you might have had three people out of a crowd of this size that were from somewhere else. Everybody was from right there, you know. Uh, I lived in Kentucky for a while. You joked about <laughs> Kentucky. I lived in Kentucky for five and a half years and worked in a Tennessee prison as a chaplain and uh, was, a, uh, was a, a prison preacher. And uh, during those years, I, I met a lot of Kentucky people who had never been outside their own county. And I moved there from, uh, I moved there from Colorado, actually, and... Uh, and uh, people would say, uh, really? You moved here from Denver? Why? <laughs> yeah. Like that, like that. I didn't tell them, but I wanted to say, boy, I sure don't know. <laughs> but I did feel like I'd gone backwards 20 years, I'm telling you for sure. <laughs> but it, there are some great folks everywhere I've ever been, That's and right. uh, I, I, I have not really been outside the United States that much. I've been up in Canada a little bit, been, over, been in Alaska a few times, and uh, got to see what that's like. But uh, really, I'm, I'm just, what, what he said is, is true, I am just a preacher. And I thank God for the privilege that he's given me to be able to spend my life studying and Amen. preaching the Bible. That's, uh, that's really all I ever want to do with the rest of my life. I want to just mention that we have some literature items over here that you're welcome to take with you. And uh, I, I, write to, I write a little bit of drivel here and there. And uh, uh, I, I, my kids keep telling me I need to have a blog. And um, I, uh, I, 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 in fact, they even got me one. They, you know, I, I, I've never gone on it yet, but it's, it's there for me if I ever get around to it. But uh, I, uh, I, I write, I write uh, little stories here and there and, uh, and events of my life and things that I've seen and experienced. And some of those are in that little newsletter that you'll see there, the Hourglass. If you don't pick up any other, you might be very interested. I think the, probably the most compelling story that I have there is the story, A Teardrop on Your, on your Shoe. You'll, uh, you might enjoy reading that. And, Please feel free to pick up any of those things that are, that are there. There's one item. I may have some more in the little satchel. I'm not sure. But if you'd like, I'll, I will check on those. Uh, there's an item written by the president of the mission, Baptist Missions of Forgotten Peoples, the group that I work with. Dr. Gene Burge wrote that article there <coughs> about how to pray for missionaries. And he has some very interesting uh, methods that you can use if you will develop those. 
I honestly I don't think you can use them all at once. You have to you have to kind of grow into it to to learn how to pray for your missionaries. I want to say thank you to the family from uh, Maryland for being here, uh, Pastor and his family. Uh, you know, they're vacationing, but they've been in church. Amen. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate you coming and supporting what we're doing here. And I probably drop in and check up on you one of these yeah. days. My uh, my kids live not too far from where their church is, and so I'll probably sneak over there one of these days when I'm supposed to be playing granddaddy. <laughs> I do ditties. Some of you are, this is, your, this is the first time that you've uh, had to look upon my fair face. <laughs> and uh, so you don't know about ditties, maybe, but uh, my granddad sang ditties. My dad sang ditties. And I guess so we just kind of grew up with ditties. My granddad used to be singing things like, If luck was a thing people sold by the slice, and I went to buy it, they would raise the price. <laughs> I, really don't, I really don't believe in luck at all, but, but that's just one of the ditties that he used to hear. He'd sing, I ain't got it, you could get it if I had it, but I'm all in, down, and out. I got a friend who'd be very glad to lend you, but he's all in, down, and out. When I had money, I was crazy to lend, but if I ever get my hand on a dollar again, I'm going to hang right to it. It's your only friend. When you're all in, down, and out, I don't like that theology. I don't even agree with it. <laughs> but that's what my granddad used to say. <laughs> and I guarantee you, he probably had lost his last dollar. Maybe that's why he was singing it. <laughs> Anyhow, here's a little ditty that I picked up some years ago, and I really don't have it memorized very well, so I'm going to use a little, a little cheat sheet here. This is entitled, Thoughts on Sunday Morning. Hmm. You know, sometimes when people are in church, they're really not thinking about the preaching. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's what inspired this song. Wonder just how many bricks are between those candlesticks what do you suppose we'll have for dinner? Wonder why old Mrs. Crest always wears that same red dress. She really isn't getting any thinner. Wow, it's getting close to time for the game on Channel 9. Hope to see Tebow return that punt. <laughs> These seats are getting hard, sure glad I was on my guard, that I sure almost had me down in front. No problem here, right? What a funny word behoove, look those bricks begin to move, when I close one eye real fast and then the other. Got to clip that fingernail, how come Bronson looks so pale, I really ought to text my brother, glad I woke up just in time. Oops, forgot to give my dime. Wonder why he's looking straight at me. <laughs> Did I do something wrong? Oh, I'd better sing along. More love to thee. More love to thee. So my friends, if this is true, playing church is what you do. Listen now and heed this solemn warning. Oh, you can't fool God, you'll find. He knows just what's on your mind when you meet to worship Him on Sunday morning. <laughs> yep. That's a ditty. <laughs> All right. Well, take your Bible, if you would, this morning and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're not going to read a lengthy passage, but we will refer to a couple of other passages in the Bible. I'd like you to find 2 Corinthians in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll read just, uh, we'll read just the first couple of verses. In fact, uh, I think we'll read through the first four verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 1 through 4, I'll let you remain seated because just too much hassle to get up and get back down. And I'll pro I probably won't keep you sitting too long, okay? okay. <laughs> I thought I'd get an amen on that at least. <laughs> I mean, I thought for some of you that might be the most spiritual thing I said so far. What did you say? <laughs> say that in this ear. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4 verse 1, Therefore, Seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. 
but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There's a lot in those four verses. I'm really going to focus in on mainly one word and then just refer to what is said about that, wor that word. And that word is the last word in verse 3. A fearsome word. Lost. Lost. Have you ever been lost? I was lost one time. It was in the Woolworths store in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. I was about four years old. <laughs> and I couldn't find my mommy. <laughs> and some fellow thought he'd help me. He came and picked me up and held me way up high so I could see over the, see over the uh, whatever they call those things they put the products on. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he held me way up there. Scared me half to death. That was worse than being lost, you know. <laughs> I was Screaming like a mashed cat, I guess. <laughs> and uh, so he finally set me back down. Well, uh, so I, honestly, I, I don't think that I have been severely lost many times in my life. I remember one of my deacons, when I was pastoring in Denver, Colorado, one of my deacons went hunting with his younger brothers. He was the eldest brother, and he had two younger brothers. And he took them hunting up in the mountains of Colorado. And while they were there, uh, they, a, a blizzard set in. And they had kind of gotten separated from one another. They thought they knew where each other might be, but when the blizzard moved in, they started trying to connect up again and realized they could not find each other. And Dave said that he walked for miles and miles and miles and thought he should have gotten back to his Bronco by this time, but he still didn't see the rig. And as he walked along, he said that all he could think about was how in the world was he going to explain to his mother and his dad how he had lost his two younger brothers. Thankfully, the clouds lifted for a bit. They managed to find each other, and he found the Bronco, and, and they came back to church. <laughs> but what a terrible experience to be lost. I read this years ago, heard it many years ago before the uh, before they had the transponder units and before they had GPS and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> an airplane, a small plane, uh, not, not a real small plane, but an airliner that was much smaller than the airliners we have now, went down in the Colorado Rockies. And a lady, they, there were a lot of, in, a lot of people injured, one lady uh, began keeping a diary. And the first day she only wrote a few words in her diary. She wrote, one died, three were crit injured critically, two men are gone for help. On the second day she wrote, we're making SOS signs in the snow. Radio communication is hopeless. Running on, low on food. Digging roots. Nobody came today. On the fifth day, she wrote, a plane flew over at 10 a.m. The men who went for help must be lost. Two or three had ba have bad coughs, high temps. Pneumonia? Question mark. Nobody came today. On the tenth day, she wrote, only half of us are still alive. Nobody is strong enough to dig graves. We're melting snow, but there's barely enough water. Nobody came today. On the 21st day, she wrote, only three of us are alive. Mrs. Smith suffered much last night, but now she's gone. I'm sure we all have pneumonia. I'd go for help, but I'm too weak. And Sandy's broken leg keeps us here. Nobody came today. And on the 27th day, she wrote, I'm alone, and the stillness is terrifying. Only a miracle could bring help now. And the last thing she wrote in her diary, nobody came today. 
Now, all this week we've been talking about the subject of missions in the Bible. And on the wall you see the map, you see the maps here, and today we've talked about where everyone here, the places that we represent and where we, we began our lives. As, we talk, as we've talked about this subject of missions, we've, we've, tried, to, we've tried to cover, and we've, we've heard a bunch of preachers this week, and, and every one of them have had a, just maybe a little different approach to the topic of missions. Uh, but really, all that we've been talking about is people who live in all of these places. People. And really, it's, it's not like hordes of people or crowds of people so much as it is individuals. Yeah. And, you know, we, we can talk about the fact that there are hordes of people who are dying and going, going out into eternity without the knowledge of Christ. But the fact is, it's, it's really just individuals who are lost lost. Listen to that, that verse again in verse 3. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. This morning I had a conversation with a man who told me that he was a Muslim. And as we talked, he began trying to convince me of how, uh, uh, of how good Muslims are. And, and he wanted to make sure that I understood that, that, uh, that the terrorists do not represent all Muslims and so on. I listened to him. I let him talk as long as, as he wanted to talk. And then finally I just said to him, I said, well, sir, I said, you know, honestly, I really believe there are only two forms of religion in the world, just two. There's only two. I said, uh, it doesn't make any difference what the name tag is. It could be Christian. It could be Buddhist. It could be Muslim. It could be Methodist, Baptist, Catholic. It could be, no matter what the name tag is, the name tag is not what counts. I said there are really only two categories of religion. There's the category that is a religion of works, and a religion of works always says you've got to do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. If you do all the do's and don't all the don'ts, you'll make it. And everybody has a different list. Some, some will tell you you have to do these things, and others will tell you you have to do different things. And uh, there's, some will t tell you you should not do certain things, and others will not agree with that list, they'll have a different list. But when you get right down to it, all of the people who believe in a works type of religion have a list of do's and a list of don'ts. But the Bible says it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. And He broke in and He began to talk to me again about about His views and, uh, and what Allah says and so on and giving me quotes from the Quran. <clears throat> And, and, and I listened patiently again for a while, and then I said to him, I said, well, you know, uh, I said, I want you to know that the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. I said, it seems to me that a lot of people in the world believe that God has selected some people that are going to go to heaven and others who are not. I would already given him a gospel tract, and that was the first comment that he made, was he said, well, I guess everybody wants to go to heaven. So I keyed back in on that same topic, and I said, yes, I believe it's true that deep down probably everybody does want to go to heaven. But what's more important than that is that God wants everybody to go to heaven. Amen. God has not selectively said, this batch goes to heaven and this batch goes to hell. No. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every one of us have to come to a time when we make an about face in our lives and we turn from our sin and we turn to God. Well, notice that this verse says in verse 3, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The word gospel means the good news. And what I just told you is good news. <laughs> the good news is that God made set, set up a plan whereby we can be forgiven of our sins. And that plan involved Jesus coming to earth, taking upon him the form of a human being, living a life as a human being, but a sinless life, uh, where he, he never once sinned. He was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. And because he could live a sinless life, he was qualified. He's the only one that ever lived that was qualified to take all of our sins upon himself. 
<laughs> Sometimes I say to people, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I think I love my kids enough that I'd be willing to die for my kids' sins. I, I really do. I mean, if I thought that my death would pay the price of my kids' sins and my kids could go to heaven if I were to die in their place, I'd be willing to do that. But it would never work. You know why? Because my death may not pay for all of my sins. <laughs> the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin. <laughs> I mean, in other words, my death might only pay for one of my sins, and I hate to tell you, maybe you're going to walk out right now when I tell you, but I've got a lot more than one. I've got a lot more than I even want to think about in my lifetime. But here's the thing. Jesus, because He had never sinned, and I really don't comprehend this, I just know it's true from the Bible, that Jesus, because He had never sinned, God the Father was willing to let Jesus die for all of us who are sinners. An innocent man died in the place of those of us who are all guilty. And God took all the sins of mankind and laid them upon Jesus. And Jesus died for the sins of the world. He died for all of those who are willing to trust in Him and all of those who are not willing to trust in Him. I believe that with all my heart. Jesus paid it all. He paid for all the sins. But the question is, Will you endorse the payment? <laughs> Are you willing to receive it as your own? Well, I wanted to speak to you about lost people very quickly as I, quickly as I can this morning. I want to d d describe to you, if I may, I believe the Bible gives us at least three categories of lost people. There may be more, but with my little pea brain, this is as good as I can do, okay? <laughs> so, and we don't have any more time than this anyway, so how about this? Three types of lost people, and I believe you can find all of them in the Bible. The first kind of lost person, uh, it, and, and I want you to notice what this verse says about the lost people. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Then the next verse says, in whom the God, notice that's a little g, not a big g, not a capital G, the God of this world. Who is that? Satan. That is Satan. Satan became the God of this world. See, God gave dominion over this world to Adam and Eve. But when Adam and Eve decided to surrender to, to Satan and go, go Satan's route, Satan became the God of this world. And so it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. See, the, the light that comes from Christ. Remember, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And Jesus' light is reaching out to every corner of this world, seeking to reach people. And, and, and that light, uh, but, but that light is hidden from those who are unbelievers. Notice what it says. The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. First kind of lost person, and I'd like to show you this one, is back in Acts chapter 3. If you have your Bible or have, can share a Bible with someone there, Acts chapter 3 tells us a story, and I believe here is this particular kind of lost person is mentioned. Acts chapter 3 is the story of Peter and John going into the temple at the hour of prayer. There was a lame man there who, was, who they spoke to, and God healed him. And uh, it's, it tells us then in, in verse 10, they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. They were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, speaking of Jesus, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, speaking of Barabbas, and, and killed the Prince of Life, again, speaking of Jesus, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Now skip over, just for the sake of time, and look at verse 17. And now, brethren, 
I wot, that word wot, old, old English word that means I understand. I understand that through ignorance ye did it. The first kind of lost person is the person who is lost in ignorance. They are lost, but they do not know they are lost. They are lost and they're blinded to the truth of Christ and to the light that shines from Christ, the spiritual light of God. They're blinded to that light, but they are ignorant of the fact that they are blinded. And I believe that those come in all kinds of categories. I think we can find them all over the world today. There are people who are lost, but they don't know they're lost. They're lost, and they're ignorant of the fact that they're lost. When I use the word ignorant, I'm not using it in a negative connotation, like to say that, you, you know, you're ignorant, you know, <laughs> like a, a negative uh, kind of a put down. Uh, but I'm just saying ignorant just means you don't know. And these are lost people who do not know they are lost. All over the world there are people like that. People who worship sticks and stones. People who worship beasts and images that they've made themselves. And there are people who have other kinds of religions. Let me just say to you that I believe there are many, many people right here in the United States of America who would tell you, if you ask them, they would tell you, I am a Christian but the fact is they are lost in ignorance. They are lost, but they do not know they are lost. They think they are a Christian because they were born into a family of people who said they were Christians. They think they are Christians because they put their membership in some church somewhere. They think they are Christians because they were baptized or went through some other kind of ritual. But listen, to be lost is... Being lost in ignorance is, is, a, is, is a terrible situation. And, and you, you know, I want to say to you this morning that you and I, uh, we, we, we are responsible to take the gospel message to, to people like that. Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but he also gave to us the responsibility to take the light of the gospel to others. Uh, there are many, probably, who we could use as illustrations in the Bible who were lost in ignorance. And uh, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hurry along, but let me, let me give you a, a story. Just recently I had a car for sale. This car that I'm driving was given to me by a church uh, where I preached for a number of months. Their pastor was dying, and, and, uh, and, and I needed a car, and they figured that out. They gave me this car. So I had an old car, I had an old a 96 Buick Regal, had 235,000 miles on it, and so I put it up for sale. A man came by and saw the for sale sign, stopped in, wanted to look at it. He took it for a ride, he and his wife took it for a ride, he came back. He said he wanted to buy it for his niece. And so uh, he, he, he agreed to the price, he came into my house, we sat at my kitchen table, and uh, we... I made out a bill of sale, and I gave him the title and all that, and he was getting ready to leave, and I, I called him by name, and I said, George, I'd just like to ask you a question. Do you know for sure that if you were to die today that you'd be going to heaven, or would you have some doubt? And, he, and, and I, I like using that little phrase, or would you have some doubt, <laughs> because it kind of helps flush folks out of the weeds, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And that's exactly what happened. He said, I would have some doubt. And I began to talk with him. He told me, he ended up telling me that he had been a treasurer in a church uh, at one time. And there were a group of men that were counting the money, and he was responsible to keep the records. He was a very young man, and the pastor had asked him to do this job, and he would go in and sit in this room while these men would count money, and he would write down the, the, the he would keep the records. And after some weeks of this, he went to the pastor and said, Pastor, uh, the men who are counting the money are stealing money. They're taking the money. And he said, I don't know what to do about it, but I needed to report it to you. The pastor said, I'll take care of it. But he never did. Nothing was ever done. No, The procedures were left the same. And so George said that he would go in and he would observe them counting, and he realized money was disappearing, and they were they were actually stealing the church money. 
So after several more weeks, George, as a young man, had gone to this uh, pastor and said, I can't do this anymore. And he left the church. And now for many, many years, he had not gone to any church because of what he had seen in that place. Now, when I asked George the question, do you know for sure that if you were to die that you'd be going to heaven or would you have some doubt? He admitted that he had some doubt. But he still thought of himself as being better than the men who were stealing the money. But the more we talked, and as I began to show him what the Bible says, that all of us are sinners, he acknowledged that, yes, he had sinned. And, and I said, and, and as, as I continued talking with him, there came a point in the conversation where, where George just acknowledged. He says, I guess I've really never been saved. And he bowed his head at my kitchen table and trusted Christ as his Savior. Amen. <laughs> That's just maybe five or six weeks ago. Amen. See, George was th thought of himself as a Christian. He even was an officer in a church. He, had, he was responsible. And he was a good man in many ways, as men go. But he had never been brought face to face with the fact that he was lost. We are all lost until we receive Christ into our hearts by faith. Lost in ignorance. Oh, I could give you so many illustrations, and, uh, and, and I'd, I'd like to just, I, I guess I'd like to tell you today about my, my wife. My wife grew up in a Christian home. Her parents both did trust the Lord, and they knew the Lord. They had family altar. They went to church and Sunday school. Sharon grew up in Sunday school. She lived in Minnesota, and there was a tornado that hit their place. And, and when the tornado hit, uh, uh, her mother took the kids down into the basement of the house, and they were hiding from the tornado, and the tornado was ripping up trees and all kinds of things. And so uh, Sharon was five years of age. Her older brother was seven, and, and her older brother, seven years old, said to his mother, Mama, I want to get saved. I want to ask Jesus to come into my heart. He had apparently been thinking about it quite a bit. And so that day, Daryl did trust the Lord. And by the way, Daryl became a preacher. And I really believe that probably Daryl did trust Christ sincerely that day with the tornado. But then, her mother turned to Sharon and said, Honey, don't you want to trust Jesus too? Well, hey, the tornado's coming, right? <laughs> you can hear it out there. You're five years old. Mama says this is what you should do. She went through the motions. She prayed a prayer. She did not remember it at all. Years went by. The church she grew up in, I do not like this system, uh, but I'm just telling you the story exactly as it happened. The church that she grew up in had the tradition that uh, kids could not be baptized until they were 12 years of age. And they had to go through a, a, a series of classes before they could be baptized. And after the end of the classes, they, the deacons and the pastor would come in and they would question them. And if the kids could give a good testimony and it sounded like they really knew the Lord, they had been saved, then the, they would approve for them to be baptized. Well, my wife went through the class at age 12. And the last week of the class, one of the last weeks of the class, the pastor announced that, that now next week, uh, the deacons are coming, and uh, the deacons are coming. Oh, but, uh, the, oh no, the deacons are coming, and uh, and so that you, we'll all we'll listen to your testimony and find out when you were saved. My wife went home and said to her mother, "Mama, when was I saved?" Uh oh. Can I say to you that if you're not sure that you remember when you were saved, you're not sure that you know when you were saved, it's highly suspect whether you really have been saved. Honestly, I believe, I, I trusted Christ as my Savior at age seven, and I, I can tell you that it is as clear a memory in my, in my life as anything that has ever happened to me. I've forgotten a lot of other things over the years, but I have never been able to shake the memory of exactly what led up to it for several weeks as I was struggling with the knowledge of realizing I'm a sinner and I need to trust Christ. Well, my wife went back to the class. Her, her mother told her the story. I think her mother made a terrible mistake that day, to be honest with you. I think she should have said, well, honey, when were you saved? <laughs> and she should have put it back on her. But instead, 
she told her the story about the tornado, and Sharon went back down to the, to the class, told the deacons and the pastor about the tornado and how she had prayed to trust Christ. It sounded good to them, they agreed, and she got baptized. I met my wife in Bible college, and uh, one of the first questions I asked her was, when were you saved? Here's what she said to me. Well, I was going to public school, and in high school they were teaching evolution, and I got to wondering whether the I got to wondering about the cavemen. Where were the cavemen, you know, in the Bible, and all that? And uh, she said uh, she said that uh, she began to wonder uh, wonder about evolution, and began to wonder is there really a God? Because the teachers in school seemed to be saying that, you know, this didn't come from God. Didn't create things. They just evolved. And so one day, her mother, by the way, her mother was dying of cancer by this time, and she was 16 years of age. My, my wife was 16. She had to do a lot of the housework and work at home. And so on Saturday afternoon, if she got all of her work done, she could have some time to herself. And she went into her room, she said, and got her Bible, and she tried to read her Bible, and she kept thinking about this thing about evolution. And finally, she cried out to God in prayer and said, God, if you're really there, I want to believe in you. Now, I do not know that I can say that you couldn't get saved that way. I'm not going to say that. I do not know what really happened in her heart. But I do know this. It takes more than just acknowledging that there is a God to be saved. <clears throat> a lot of people believe in God and believe there is a God, but they have not been saved. Okay, so my wife told me that story about how when she was 16 years old, she prayed that prayer. A couple more years went by. Several more years went by. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was a pastor. We were starting a church. I had 13 people ready to be baptized. We were going to have a baptismal service in another church where we were using their baptistry on Sunday afternoon. And as I was preparing for my what I was going to do, I was going to preach a short message about uh, baptism, and then I was going to do this, these baptisms. And so I was thinking about illustrations, and I was going to tell about when I was baptized. And so I called out to my wife in the kitchen, and I said, Hun, uh, when were you baptized? I couldn't remember that I had ever heard that story. So I came out into the kitchen, and she told me about how she was baptized when she was 12. And I said, what? I thought you were saved when you were 16 in your room. Well, she said, maybe I was saved when I was five, and then she told me about the tornado. That was the first time I ever heard about the tornado. Well, I tried, did my best to try to tell her that she needed to, she needed to make sure that she, she should be baptized again. If she got saved when she was 16, then according to the Bible, she needed to be baptized upon a profession of faith. And so I, I tried to press her with that, but I couldn't win, and I lost the argument. And she, said, she, she told me that it was okay, and so we went on. A couple more years went by. We had left the church plant in Nebraska, and now we were in Colorado. We were going to a large church, and they were baptizing people every Sunday. One day my wife said, I think you were right. I think I need to be baptized again. And I should be baptized upon a profession of faith. So she went forward, and she was baptized in that church. I thought, okay, good. Now we've got this settled. But a couple more years went by, and one night my wife said to me, I don't really think I've ever been saved. I've been a pastor for some time. Now please understand, I'm, I am not one of those preachers that tries to go around and make people doubt their salvation. I believe that God wants you to be solidly assured of your salvation. But I want to say this to you. I do believe that sometimes people have put their, their confidence in, in things that, that aren't solid. And they've, they've not really, they've not really uh, gotten things settled. For my wife, that night our pastor came over and sat in our living room and they talked. And he said to her, of course she, had, she was a Bible college graduate. <laughs> she sat there with her Bible in her lap and he said, uh, Sharon, what is the verse that's on the front of our Wednesday night prayer bulletin? And she, she couldn't think what it was. He told her, Mark eleven twenty four, 24. What things soever ye pray, when, when you pray, uh, I'm sorry, I can't, can't come up with it. Mark eleven twenty four, 24. 
uh, she, 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 was, she turned to the passage and she read it. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. Now I've never heard of anybody else getting saved on that verse, but, but my wife said, uh, but I want to, I want to uh, believe. But she said, how can I be sure that I believed in my heart? He said, don't worry about that right now. Just focus on the first part of the verse. What things soever ye desire. What do you desire? Do you desire to be saved? She said, yes. Do you desire to know the Lord? Yes. Do you desire to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Do you desire to have eternal life? And Do you desire to have your sins forgiven? He went through a whole list of things like that. She said yes to everyone. Then he quoted the verse, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye shall receive them, and ye shall have them. And at that moment, somehow, my wife, it, the, the light came on in her heart. And she said, okay. There were actually no tears at that point. She just bowed her head and simply prayed. And from that day to this, that was in about 1977, from that day to this, she's had no doubts about her salvation. <clears throat> By the way, in the next Sunday, she got baptized again. <laughs> but anyhow, so here was a lady who was a Bible college graduate, grew up in a Christian home, and yet I believe she was as lost in ignorance as perhaps someone who has never even heard of Christ. So there are those who are lost in ignorance. Very quickly, I want to mention two others. If we were to go to Genesis chapter 4, and I won't have you turn there, there's the story of Cain and Abel. And I believe that Cain tell, it represents to us uh, those people who are lost in impudence. In other words, those who are lost in pride. Now, Cain was not lost in ignorance. He, did, he, he was well aware of his, his lostness. But he hardened his heart and he refused to do what God told him to do. He, 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 turned, he turned a hard heart toward God. He was filled with pride. And, and he, was, he was too proud to do it God's way. He was too proud to, to surrender his heart and life to the Lord. I believe that there are many who come to the place where they are no longer lost in ignorance. But now it is a matter of pride. In fact, I would say this. I think there was a time for my wife when she went through that. Because after all, think about it. She was a preacher's wife. She was a Bible college graduate. She had taught Sunday school classes. How could she come and say, I don't think I've ever been saved. Do you see how pride gets its tentacles into us? And, and we refuse to turn to the Lord. The third... The third kind of lost person I, I hasten to tell you is those who are lost in indulgence. The example in the Bible is the man Esau, Jacob and Esau. Jacob, uh, Jacob was not a, a nice guy in some ways. In fact, a lot of things, a lot of ways, I think I might like Esau better than Jacob if I knew the two fellas. <laughs> but the thing about Esau was this. When the opportunity came to to either receive the blessing of God or a bowl of soup, he chose to fill his belly. He wanted to fulfill his appetites more than he wanted the blessing of God. And so he chose a bowl of soup over, over the blessing of God. I say to you, he was lost in indulgence. For years I preached in Bible camps and summer camps for, with kids and teenagers especially. And I can't tell you how many times I've, I've talked to teenagers that, that said to me, uh, and by the way, they were not lost in ignorance. They were aware of it. They were aware of the fact that they needed to be saved. They were not lost in impudence. Pride was not really a problem because they'd look you right in the eye and say, no, I'm not saved. I've never been saved. Well, don't you want to trust the Lord? Don't you want to be saved? Not yet. And I've had guys actually say to me, Brother Spear, I want to find out what it's like to be high, get high. I want to find out what it's like to get drunk before I get saved. They were lost in indulgence. They wanted to indulge the pleasures of the flesh more than they wanted to come to God and receive the blessings of God. Lost. Oh, I, I, I want to wrap it up very quickly. This is sort of a, a strange story perhaps to you, but... I heard this uh, a radio preacher give this story many, many years ago, and to me it sort of, it sort of emphasizes the, the 
how crucial it is that we come to grips with the fact that we are lost when we are lost. I'm so thankful that as a boy, I went through a period of time. Uh, my parents took me to a revival meeting, and it was not at our church. I was afraid of people. I was very shy, and I, I, I hung back, and, and uh, there was a cowboy preacher there, and he could do rope tricks, and he could also uh, play a guitar, uh, play a guitar, and he had a gizmo he hung around his neck and play a, a mouth harp, you know, a uh, harmonica. And man, to a seven-year-old boy, I was just amazed that this guy had wanted to be a cowboy preacher like him. But he preached a message that night about the coming, second coming of Christ and, and talked about how Jesus is coming back and you'd better be ready when G Jesus comes. And when they gave the invitation that night, I knew that I should come forward and trust Jesus. But I hardened my heart. Hey, did you hear me? A seven-year-old boy. I hardened my heart. And I held to the back of the pew. I kept waiting, hoping that maybe somebody else would go up, but nobody did. I've often thought about that preacher and wondered, you know, he may have gone away discouraged that day thinking that his message fell flat, but the truth is it took deep root in my heart. I walked out of the church that night and I stood outside on the parking lot. Other kids were playing tag and trying to get me to play with them, but I didn't feel like playing and I didn't feel like laughing or being happy. I just stood there by the, by the steps of the church until finally my parents came out and my dad said, get in the car, we're going home. We got in the back seat, I got in the back seat of the car, we drove home. I don't know whether it was that night or another night later, that late at night I woke up and it was very quiet. We lived out in the country in Nebraska, no yard light, and it was a very dark night, and it was very silent. And I thought, uh-oh, Jesus has come, and I'm not ready. I wasn't ready. He's already here. I began to call out, Mama! Daddy! <laughs> we lived in a very small house, four rooms. <laughs> There were, there were no doors between our bedrooms. There were just uh, curtains, you know, to, so the heat could get from the, the central stove. <laughs> and uh, so there's no reason why they couldn't have heard me. I sometimes wonder if God sent an angel to plug my parents' ears right then to help the conviction build in my heart a little more and make me realize how much I needed to trust Christ. But I called out several times and they never answered Finally, I thought about my little brother, my younger brother, and I thought, I wonder if he's still here. And so I reached over and into his bed, and I felt his leg, and for a moment I had a moment of relief. Whew, he's still here. And then I thought, man, he's a mean little kid. He's probably not saved either. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then it was on me again, and I began to cry out again. And finally, my parents, uh, I heard my dad go, <clears throat> like that. What a wonderful sound. <laughs> You'd have thought I'd have jumped out of bed and gone in to tell my parents that I knew, knew I needed to be saved. But no, a seven-year-old boy can harden his heart again, and I did. And I, I, I just turned over and went back to sleep. And it was several days later when we listened to a radio broadcast, of the Back to the Bible youth broadcast, and they were... It was a story, and I listened to this story about two teenagers, and this teenage boy thought he could outrun the train, and he was driving the car, and his girlfriend's in the car with him, and she's screaming and telling him to stop, and he says, I can outrun the train, and he tried to outrun the train, and the train hit their car, and that was the end of the radio broadcast. Tune in again next week, you know. And, man, I was thinking about if I would have been in that car, I wouldn't have been saved. I, wouldn't have, I, I wasn't ready to die. But in a few minutes, I was able to put it out of my mind. Radio announcer came on and said, You're listening to KNEB, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. <laughs> and then they had a commercial. And you know, I was able to put it out of my mind again. But later that day, my aunt read a little article out of the newspaper to me about a boy in Michigan. I'd never been to Michigan, didn't know anybody in Michigan. But a boy in Michigan who was seven years of age, uh, seven years of age, uh, in this little article, was was snow, uh, playing uh, snowballing with his friends, and he made a snowball and he stepped out from between two cars to throw a snowball. And when he did, a truck hit him and killed him. Seven years of age. 
Now, I lived way out in the country. I wasn't anywhere in, in, in really in danger of, of getting hit by a truck. <laughs> it was a, our, our driveway was a quarter of a mile long out on our farm. But God was speaking to my heart. And when I walked back to my, my house that day with that newspaper in my hand, I handed the newspaper to my mother and I went in and sat, on my, sat in, in, in my uh, bedroom and looked in a mirror and glared at myself for a while and, and finally I said, I've got I've to do this. I stood up and went out and said to my mother, Mama, I need to be saved. I need to trust Jesus. She took the Bible and explained about 45 verses, I guess. I didn't need any of them yet. <laughs> I knew all of that. And finally, she said, do you want to pray? And I knelt down there and trusted Jesus as my Savior. And I know that He, that he heard my prayer. He, and, and when I surrendered my heart that day, He saved me and I was born again. I say to you today, you can go through these phases of being lost in ignorance. You can be lost in impudence and be impudent about it and resentful and prideful toward God. You can be lost in indulgence and putting it off and saying, I want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But there has to come a time when you will trust Christ as your Savior. That's really the message that missions is about. It's the message of helping folks to come out of ignorance, to come to grips with the fact that every soul needs to trust Christ as their Savior. There were two boys that lived in, in the same home he grew up in the same home, and they, they, they grew up and never married. Their mother tried to influence them for the things of the Lord, but they never, they never surrendered, and they, they just continued living godless lives. Their mother died, their families all died, and these men remained as bachelors living in the same house where they grew up. One had a bedroom upstairs, and the other had a bedroom on the lower floor. And one night, after they were now in their 70s, the, boy, the, the, young man, the man who was, uh, who was living on the lower floor awoke in the middle of the night, and, and he thought that uh, he, 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 he awoke suddenly. He, uh, he thought that uh, in, in his dream, he, he was really having a dream, and he, he thought that he awakened, and he imagined in his dream that he was going upstairs to look at, it, look at his brother. And in his dream he said that uh, he walked into his brother's room and looked at his brother there, but his brother was not breathing. And in his dream he said that as he watched, the brother's soul came out and began to walk around and move around the room. And in through the side window came a dark figure and began to chase the little soul around the room and then went back out through the window and into the night and as he disappeared into the night he could hear his brother's soul screaming out lost I'm lost and he suddenly awoke from his dream he ran up the stairs as fast as he could went into the room and looked at his brother and shook his brother, but his brother was gone. His brother had died. The radio preacher that told the story originally said that it ended the story this way. My, my, my. Lost for all eternity. Hear me today. If you have never trusted Jesus, you could trust him. It's not a matter of joining the church. It's not a matter of any ritual of baptism or whatever, but it is a matter of you coming to surrender your heart and life and call upon the Lord Jesus as your Savior that you might be saved. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to speak today about this crucial word, lost. While our heads are bowed, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to hearts in a way that I cannot. Help, Lord, that some who have been struggling with this concept and realizing that they are sinners, realizing that they need a Savior, help them to see that Jesus died on the cross and paid the price of their sins. If they will come and trust Him and Him alone, He will forgive their sins. 
He will take them to heaven one day when they die. While our heads are bowed, I'd like to ask you this. Would you say to me, Brother Spear, the Lord is speaking to my heart today. I know that I need to trust Jesus and be saved. I want to do that. I'm not sure I understand it completely, but I want to surrender my heart to the Lord and let him save my soul. Would you lift up your hand there where you are right now? Anyone like that at all? Okay, yes, yes. I see your hands, yes. Is there anyone else right now? Okay, you may put your hands back down. Let me ask you this. I'm wondering if you would say, Brother Spear, there is someone here that I'm praying for today. I'm earnestly praying for a specific person, not just generally praying for lost people, but I am earnestly praying for a specific person. And I don't, I don't want you to point out the person or anything like that, but just with our heads bowed again, I'd like you to just lift your hand if there's someone that you're specifically praying for here in this room today. One, two, at least two that are praying. Yes, there's another one. Okay, God bless you. <clears throat> Let me ask you to do this. We're going to stand right now and hear a, a, a song uh, of, an in, of an invitation song. As we stand right now, all together, let's stand, please. The Lord speak into your heart. If you would, I'd like to invite you to step out and come and kneel here and pray for those people that are on your heart. And if you need to be saved, would you come to step out and publicly trust Jesus as your Savior? We want to take the Bible and show you from the Bible how you can know that you're saved when you leave here today. Will you come right now? If you're, if you're ready to come, just do that right now. That's right. Don't wait for anybody else. This is between you and God. This is all about you. You come right now. That's right. God bless you. I just want to tell you something. There aren't any know-it-alls in our church. Not really. Nobody knows everything here. But we've got a Bible that has an answer to absolutely everything in life. And I'm talking about if you've got problems, you've got problems at home, you've got problems at work, you've got things that you're dealing with, this Bible that we have has the answers, and we know how to find them so we can help you. And that's why we want you to be here today. We're so delighted that you've come and you've been with us here this morning. And uh, we want to ask that you'll stay and uh, fellowship with us over next door. We're going to have a soup and stew lunch. And following that, uh, we're going to have just a quick service. And that'll be it for today. And we'll have you out of here in pretty, pretty quick. I was thinking 3 o'clock, but I think it's going to be a lot sooner than that. You've got to eat somewhere, right? And so you might as well eat here. So please don't leave. Please stay in fellowship with us. And I want to be able to have the opportunity to spend time with you. And so we're so thrilled that you've come this morning. Pastor, this is Mary and Mike. Yes. And they've trusted Jesus as their Savior today. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. the Lord. This is the most wonderful thing that could ever happen in your life. And uh, it's happened 
Uh, it happened to me 30 years ago. It changed my life. It's a wonderful start for us. Do you rejoice with them? We just say amen. 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 And we, don't, we certainly don't want to single you out or embarrass you, but just stay where you're at so people can come by and just uh, give you encouraging words. You don't have to. You can sit down somewhere. And uh, But uh, we're so thrilled that you that they've come with us. They've been visiting for a while, and today they've been saved. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. That's what God does. He saves, saves souls. And everybody here who's saved went through the very same thing that you folks have. And so we rejoice with you. Thank you for being encouragement by coming with us today. All right. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to set things up next door, so I'm going to pray. And you folks just fellowship a little bit, and I'll come find out. And then I'll tell you. So don't go over there yet so that they can. I think we may be setting up over here for our meal. But uh, let's just have a good time of fellowship one with another, and then we'll eat. And everybody likes to do that, so we'll have a great day. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you've done here today. Lord, thank you so much for the Bible that very plainly shows us our need for eternal life. And Lord, more than that, that shows us that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And we thank you for our salvation. Thank you for folks that have come to Jesus today. Lord, I ask there's anyone else here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that today would be their day of salvation, Lord. We praise you for what you do. And we thank you for the time we're about to have. We ask you to bless the food that we're about to eat. And we thank you for that as well. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for your Bible? Yes, I had a dream and I felt like it was lost.